I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Ian, welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. I'm super happy to be here. So as always, we just had the conversation to end <laughs> all conversations before the mics were on. I can't tell you how many times that's happened. We sit down, hey, good to see you, man. Yeah, Get quite a, a few at this point. We start chatting about all things off the record and I'm always going like, God, I wish I just hit the recorder right now. We already have it done. Uh, but we do have a topic today. And uh, sometimes in conversations with you, I notice we're able to stick to a topic. Sometimes not. Because sometimes not. You're a nonlinear <laughs> being. Uh, that is very true. <laughs> just like myself. So I'm excited to meander where we want to go. We're definitely going to be talking about ozone today. Mm -hmm. uh, so those that uh, saw the title of this podcast and are wondering, like, when's the ozone part? Uh, it will happen. But first, I want to ask you, uh, you are a mad scientist. That I am. Uh, in the truest sense, you've got a laboratory and you are working on all sorts of solutions to improve the lives of humankind all the time. Mm -hmm. I think you told me one time you have a whiteboard in your office that's like global warming, cancer, the, yeah. you know, like the yeah. big ones, right? Yeah. So I wanted to start off by asking you, what are you know the things you can talk about? I understand there are patents and things sometimes sure. that get in the way of that and legal and medical claims and all that. But what are some of the things that you're working on right now that are making your head spin in the best of ways? Well, let's, okay. So the things that I actually find really kind of cool right now, one is um, the carbon negative concrete. And I've been working on that for a while because that's, that's actually pretty profound to me because it carbon generally accounts for about 8% of all the CO2 emissions because it's the most, you know, kind of ubiquitously used product for construction in the world. And if, if, if actually, if it were a country, it would be the third largest producer of CO2 behind China and the U.S. Yeah, wow. it, it's it's actually pretty chunky. What about India? No, it, it's way down below that. Really? Yeah, oh, okay. actually, surprisingly. Yeah, just the industrialization. They haven't quite hit the same point on the curve. Makes sense. Yeah, but China is, you know, they're they're really pumping out quite a bit, almost double what the U.S. is pound for pound. And uh, not not in terms of population, though. Per capita, it's far less. Uh, but overall, the totality, because their population is almost five times as big, it has more of a pronounced impact. Um, so the, the concrete is neat because it offsets, it negates the the eight percent that would be produced, and then it offsets another twenty four percent. So wow. yeah, so if everybody, and I know that it's a pipe dream, like everybody isn't going to just across the board switch to it, but it would negate about a third of all the global annual greenhouse gas emissions, which is great in terms of with this. Uh, uh carbon negative concrete that you created uh, in terms of scalability, is the technology simplistic enough to replicate where Crazy the simple. whole world could be mm -hmm. on this type of concrete? Yeah. And th that was actually one of the, the goals with this was to do something so that quite literally just a couple of components had to be swapped out and the people who are actually placing the concrete they won't know. There, there will be no shift. It's just in the manufacturing process, there'll be a couple of tweaks done and then that just sets up a cascade and then that wave just propagates. So it's it's easy. And that, and that was part of it because if you come up with some really very bizarrely abstracted thing that's difficult to do, how much positive benefit are you really going to be able to leverage? Not that much. Because if you make it untenable for people to actually move forward with it, you know, you, you haven't really done much. It's like being the most evolved person who hides in your cave. You know, you're not, right. I mean, how much are you changing the needle for humanity? Right. And, yeah. yeah. And in, uh, in the experience I'm having of renovating this house here in Texas, which you're going to see in, <laughs> after we're done, when I started looking into different ways to, I mean, I'm not, you know, it's not a new build, but basically I took everything down to studs, sheetrock and concrete. I mean, just mm -hmm. the whole house is gutted, uh, which was not the original plan as I'm sure anyone that's renovated a home knows. You're like, hey, let's take down that wall too. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's quite a project uh, and not an easy one. But when I started looking into materials and I'm like, well, I want green everything. I realized very quickly, A, that the market is uh, definitely less saturated with green products of all types and B, that they are way, way more expensive, mm -hmm. generally speaking. And I know there are, you know, it's a nuanced uh you know, kind of market. But, uh, you know, I looked into no VOC uh, engineered wood floors and I found right. some that were comparable that looked nice. And then of course the no VOC paint and looking at ways to filter the air. And I just found actually, speaking of ozone, I just stumbled across um, 
Oh, I forget the name of the company, but I'll put it in the show notes. O3, ah, I'm so sorry to them. They were so kind to me. And they sent me this spray bottle a few months ago mm-hmm. uh, that you plug in and it creates ozonated water. And that oh, becomes like your new whole house cleaner. Yeah. It's insane. And all you have to do is put water in it and charge it up. And then I found- it's what nature uses. Right? <laughs> and we're going to be talking about ozone. And then I found uh, someone on Instagram that listens to the show sent me this ozone generator that connects to your washer, mm-hmm. your washing machine, yeah. and, and negates any and all future use of any disinfectants yeah, or- Yeah, no detergents necessary. Detergents, mm-hmm. anything. And it's like four hundred dollars. I yeah, mean, I probably spent four hundred dollars on laundry soap from Whole Foods every four months or what. You know, it's like it's ridiculous. Right. I see the auto ship actually come from Amazon. I'm like, how did I spend one hundred fifty dollars on laundry soap? Like, I wear the same jeans every day. Uh, you, you, it, actually, they're using that for pools too, like large scale ozonation. They use it in pools. That's what I want in my pool. Yeah, because that's the thing. The other day, uh, the new pool guy whose name is uh, Alonzo, I will give him a shout out. Although I don't know his company, I'll get it in the show notes. Great guy, and he comes over, and I was like, I don't want chlorine in my pool. I'm not going to do anything. So I just let the pool <laughs> sit there, <laughs> and it, it was right after the big Texas snowpocalypse. So all the trees had lost their leaves. That's and it, a petri and, dish, man. Yeah, and. <laughs> All the leaves in a square mile uh, where I live went into my pool, yeah, apparently. Sure. And um, and the water turned opaque green and smelly. And even I didn't want to get into it. And I swim in creeks with, you know, like cotton mouths, you know, like I don't care. And I talked to him and he had to, he had to do this thing called, um, uh, it's called a shock. Shocking it. Yeah. yeah. Harsh chemicals. Yeah. He had to put yeah. all this stuff in there. And I'm like, I don't want that. Then it, it's going to, you know, we drain the pool. It's going to go into the water table and into Lake Travis. I'm not about that. So I said, hey, man, how can we disinfect the pool and not use chlorine? He's like, you have to. And I said, aha, au contraire, mon frere. What if I do <laughs> a saltwater pool? He's like, yeah, bacteria grows in salt too. You still have to put the little chlorine disc in your pump. So I was like, okay, I guess I have a chemical pool and there's no way out. Ozone. But there are ozone yeah, there pool are. systems? Mm-hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Rad. Okay, so that's one. Anyway, this company that I'll put in the show notes, which you can find at lukestory.com, uh, they make this little wall unit and it cleans your freaking clothes and prevents any mold from building up in the oh, internal yeah. parts of your washing machine. So I'm like, again, that's a fantastic setup, actually. Ozone I've looked at it. It does yeah. like everything, and we're going to talk about it. But um, anyway, back to the the concrete, I'm finding like having a green home is not as easy because of the availability or expense yeah. of materials. So, and that's got to that's got to change. I mean, you, you look at the companies that are doing the different green products and uh, you know, you're doing zero VOC paints so probably like Regal Aqua Velvet and you know, like all the really premium ones and they charge for that. You should have seen the look on my GC's face when I was like, here's the paint I want. He's like, no, you're not, <laughs> not with your bid. <laughs> he goes, have you heard yeah. of this thing called an allowance? You just went over. So, you know, he's going to get like bare, no VOC, VOC paint from Home Depot. And I just, you know, I'll take the paint that they put all of the other VOCs in. Yeah. I just said <laughs> a discount. You got to, you got to choose your battles. But from what I understand, this concrete that you developed is also super badass looking in black. Yeah. It looks like Onyx. I'll, I'll send you some pics. You can put them up. It looks super cool. Ah, man. When I do the next move, which I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it'll be a build, you know, Mm because no house has all the things the way I want, of course, being the neurotic nut that I am. Um, you need but, more biohacking space, always, right. always. <laughs> but I mean, how sick would that be to make your whole foundation out of this black? And then you could have like really cool concrete floors that are polished black and look like obsidian. Yeah, well, and there's some other benefits. I mean, like normally I wouldn't even delve into it, but, you know, concrete has kind of a draining effect on your physiology. Um, Bow biology, which is kind of the German science of building biology, uh, which actually came about because after the after World War II, when the, the U.S. came in and they were doing reparations, they were building a lot of houses and dwellings and businesses for people. And they found that the incidence of cancer was going up and a lot of things were, uh, were kind of dysregulating physically. And so they started studying what was going wrong and they found that it was actually based on the buildings, the techniques that they were using. And so there are a lot of places where concrete, um, they would actually have cork inserts in the floor where people were going to stand a long time. Because what happens is your body's kind of a balance of paramagnetism, diamagnetism, right? And so you're a balanced system. And if you stand on something that is completely skewed to one side, you're like a, a little bitty magnet on a giant magnet, and you're trying to balance out the net charge. And so it ends up draining you. And the Germans had this really, you know, kind of advanced tech. I mean, it's 
just about the best thing I've seen other than some old school uh, Stapacha Vedic architecture stuff, which, you know, it's 6,000 years old, but quite literally, I don't think I've ever seen a better building system. I mean, they had so much stuff dialed in with Stapacha Veda or the other, the other term it goes by is Vastu Shilpa Shastra. And that was very dialed in in terms of geomagnetics, but they, in Germany did scans and they could see that there was cellular paralysis occurring in the cells that were in contact proximate to the concrete. And, you know, they weren't processing waste and, and it was just causing cellular paralysis. So they would do these cutouts where they would have people stand on floors. And it's actually, you know, in Europe, they outlawed um, fiberglass insulation, you know, and things and asbestos and, you know, things that we eventually did in some cases, we haven't done fiberglass yet, but they were very much ahead because they were actually looking at what's the physiological impact of the built environment and, you know, how do we mitigate negative things and promote positive things. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. There's so, a whole bowel biology institute in the U.S. The, the fellow who used to run it was a guy named Helmut Zihi. Uh, I haven't looked at it for probably like 20 years, but it was kind of a, an interesting thing. And I remember looking at it and there, there was an architect uh, in Austin here uh, named uh, George Swanson who developed a, a bunch of houses kind of around bio biology principles and built out in a community called Radiance, really? which, was, which was kind of like the TM community. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. They have a dome in the whole nine yards, much like Fairfield. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of, by chance, biogeometry? No. This gentleman that I'm going to interview soon, he developed this system called biogeometry. And it's it's so bizarre. It's like it's like the interview I did with with our mutual friend Philip last mm-hmm. week, the quantum stuff. It's like there are things with energetics that just make no sense on a fundamental level yeah. just to the common person, including myself, being quite common and not understanding, you know, the physics and uh, the way that it interacts with biology and all these things, which I'm doing my best to learn. But he essentially has refined a system of building and not just of building, but also of changing the energetics within a pre-existing, poorly designed building through Ah. the insertion of little geometric shapes and even kind of hieroglyphics. Is that the word hieroglyphics Mm -hmm. that are um, inscribed on various devices and you put them in very specific locations around your house. And one of the net effects is EMF mitigation. And the other one is a harmonizing field of the said space. And so when I hear things like that, I'm always like, okay, show me the proof. Cool idea, but I want to prove it. And one of the many things that he's done, and I can't wait to interview him with his thick accent. Hopefully I can catch it. (laughs) He's a brilliant guy. And and he's done some things. He works a lot in Switzerland, which is, I thought he was Swiss, but turns out he's Egyptian. But one of the things he did in this town in Switzerland is uh, it's a kind of a remote rural town and they had installed a bunch of cell towers, my Mm -hmm. arch nemesis, right? Love my cell phone, hate the towers. (laughs) And so all of the livestock were getting ill and the yields uh, of agriculture were going down and the people in the town were getting sick. Uh, And you imagine like uh, Switzerland as being this pristine sort of preserved natural Mm -hmm. environment, at least based on pictures. I've not been there, but I picture like rolling fields and, you know, (laughs) Switzerland. I have the same mental image. Seems like a great place to store your money and perhaps live. And so uh, anyway, he went into this town and he very specifically uh, placed and buried these tiny little objects around the cell towers. And not only did people's health go back to baseline, but people became incredibly healthy because the effect of these objects with his biogeometry system Mm -hmm. actually transmuted the negative impact of that radiation. He essentially changed the shape of the wave of the radiation yeah. to where the cell towers became good for you. I know it sounds crazy and I'm actually it it doesn't. You know? It really that's that's something I've been thinking about, you know, ways to move the needle, which is kind of what I'm always trying to ponder. Yeah. And one of the thoughts I had recently uh was using cell towers because it's it's everywhere, right? Everybody has a cell phone. I mean, even if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, everybody's in communication with a cell phone. And my thought was was the same thing. I mean, it's great to know that it's already being done. I was just thinking, wow, you know, if you already have this thing that everybody's doing, this was kind of the same impetus for the concrete, right? Everybody's already doing this thing. If you can make them do that thing and offer them the ability to do it in a way that actually benefits everybody, way better, you know? Just yeah. 
that's that's how you make the big leverage movement. So if you take some EMF transmission and you say, oh, instead of completely whacking your calcium channels, we're going to set this up so that you're robust and healthy. You know, there there has to be a way. <laughs> there is a way. It's and absolutely doable. I don't know that the biogeometry <laughs> that that he did in some of those experiments is necessarily scalable because you'd have to get you'd have to get the municipalities locally to buy into it and and mm-hmm. have the motivation to do it. Uh, the telecommunications industry is, I would guess, probably not that interested in it. So it's, I, I it's, wouldn't think so. Because it's not, you know, it's not, they don't even <laughs> Dollars admit, and cents, Yeah, right? they don't even admit that it's going on uh, for starters. Tobacco of the new millennia. <laughs> but it, it's a really interesting field of study and development. Like uh, our friends at FLFE, yeah. you know, found a way to take some crazy Tesla coil energy transducer transmitter thing and then program... Uh, logistics into it so that it creates a field of energy on the location where you p- program it and, and point step it, right? up someone's consciousness you, remotely. Yeah, yeah. And I know you have it on your house. I have it on mine. It's on my cell phone and I love it, but things yeah, like, I have it on my cell phone. I haven't done it on my house. Oh I'd man, probably... you got to get on your house. It's like okay. $30 a month. Dude. Yeah. Their rates are insanely cheap. It's like, like they, they actually, are, they yeah. are so cool, but I have to say, um, that I find things like this difficult to share because when you get into the unseen realms, it's difficult to quantify and it's difficult to to prove for lack of a better sense. So how how do you think we can, you know, adopt these types of technologies that are more energy based, but but find ways to quantify them and show people that it is legitimate science, that it's not woo woo wishful thinking or placebo. Yeah, uh, it's it's difficult. I think the the best way to do that is to go from the known to the unknown, right? Because because if you go back in time 400 years ago, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, you know, I mean, people are going to be watching this stuff all over the world. Literally, they could they could be dialed in watching us from you know Asia right now. And you know, Tesla actually talked about that at an IEEE convention, and people panned him. It was over a hundred years ago. He said, in the future, you know, people will communicate in real time. You'll be able to see them and talk to them. And everybody thought he was insane. And if you go back, you know, 300 more years to say 400 years ago, the stuff that we're doing is magic. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's just magic, but that's, that's always the way that it seems when you have a new technology that you can't quite grasp yet. And like Philip stuff, um, the reason I was impressed with that is I understood conceptually what they were doing and the the people that he's working with Roman and some of the other guys that are obviously their consciousness is very advanced and they're able to do things that normal people generally speaking aren't going to be able to do but they also took the the added step of saying okay rather than keep this in the realm of woo woo let's quantify it let's do dark field microscopy let's do hrv readings let's let's look at what it actually does which holds validity you know to a much higher degree i mean I, I, it's hard for me to go like, oh, I believe this when people aren't going to be able to demonstrably show it, right? When I was trying to do uh, the the biocharge product, um, I had to build a test rig to test for what was there because nothing existed to test for that, right? You know, so I was, it was kind of one of those like Frankenstein things where the, the whole desk in the lab was literally covered with electronics. I was ripping apart from other things and like, setting up effectively like curly and photography rigs with, you know, photo readers and all kinds of stuff to try and figure out how do I quantify this thing? And and that part's difficult. And it's also not recognized things like blood work that's recognized. Everybody's aware that we do in fact have blood. And, you know, when you look at someone's blood work and you see clumping because things aren't um, freely floating, that's a problem. And then when you see like the little, uh, the, you know, talisman effectively <laughs> that you have on. I mean, that cannula, it's it's holding three little titanium spheres that are charged to do a specific thing with those frequencies. And sounds a little woo-woo, but when you look at the blood work from somebody who's just put one of those things on, well, there you go. You know, the proof is in the pudding. You see the blood work before, you see the blood work five, 15, 30 minutes afterwards, and you can note just this huge change, then that is something that people can grasp. So you you go from something that's known that they're comfortable with and move towards something that's a little fringy because a thousand years from now, none of this stuff is going to seem far-fetched. People will probably manipulate energy and frequencies um, with impunity and, and, and just do it hopefully in a positive way, you know, like the guys at FLFE are doing where they're trying to actually move the needle for the benefit. And, and the same thing with Lila Q, you know, they're bringing forth good technologies, EMF blocking, 
products and things like that. It's there's a whole little cache of people that are trying to benefit, I think, the world. And so I I kind of seem to be in a in a space where I'm lucky because I get access to a lot of those technologies like you do before they're everywhere else. And for me, it's super fun because I see it and and I'll just rip it apart in the lab and start playing with it to see, okay, well, how do I quantify this? What does it do? You know, like Philip sent me stuff months before it was even out so that I could, you know, do testing on it and look at it and see what the effects were. Unfortunately, I, I broke my, my newfangled testing rig it, during the process, but it, it was, it was fun for me because I was thinking, okay, well, can I feel a difference? Cause that's the first check, right? Is do I actually feel something when it's, you know, considered fringe or woo woo. And with that, yeah, you can feel it. And same thing with the FLFE stuff, like kicks on you feel it yeah, kick on. With the FLFE too, uh, one of my favorite things to do, and I've been meaning to beg them to give me even, even higher boost, but they they have a feature when you have the FLFE home service that's called a boost mm-hmm. and you get 30 minutes a day. So you log into the portal and you click this little button, <laughs> boost, and that brings you up. I think their normal level is like 540. It on goes the, to 11. Yeah, yeah. On the, on the Hawkins. <laughs> very good. Good one. Well played. Uh, on the Hawkins scale, I think the normal FLFE service is 540 on a log, logarithmic scale from one to a thousand that we were mm-hmm. discussing earlier. And people can go back and listen to that episode with uh, Clayton and Jeffrey um, to learn more about that. But you have this boost to 600. And every day I savor that boost for (laughs) if I'm stressed out or typically if I do a Zoom interview or Uh I have a business call, I'll go in and boop and I'll boost it. And I swear to God, I feel it the minute. I mean, I haven't had, I should have Allison like blind placebo me to see like, did she hit the button or not? But I'll sit there and I'll just be like, all right, is this real? I click the button and it's like my body goes... It's, it's palpable. I mean, it's just, it's undeniable, you know? Well, you know, it's like you were talking about the, the geometry of spaces. All that stuff has an impact. To, to think that there's not some sort of order is just folly. It, it's, it just means it's, it's a human trait. And I think we, we ascribe things like, oh, well, you can't know that. It's unknowable. No, more than likely your consciousness can handle it. It just has to expand to the point where it actually makes sense and that it falls into a framework that's tangible. You know, it's like nonlinear dynamics and and chaos and things like that. When you start looking at that, there are patterns. They're just patterns that were buried beyond our level of perception. And at a certain point, you kind of you come out of that threshold and you can you can feel it, you can see it. And with regards to the space, you know, and just planting little hieroglyphics and things, that makes perfect sense. The the old um, Stapacha Vedic tradition um, from the Vedas, they would actually take. Uh, and build an appellate, uh, just kind of a grid over the site that you were going to build on and they would map it out. And all of the points where the lines would intersect on this grid were called Murma points and they corresponded to all of the pressure points in the chakras. And they would build the whole place so that the, the built environment and the space and the energies moving through the space were in accord with a person's physiology. And so, I mean, it's all, it's all linked and wow. there's, yeah, there's a definitive that's, that's pattern. So cool. it, it really is. That actually is tr- truly to date in terms of architectural systems. It's the most well thought out thing I've ever been exposed to. And I, I'm sure because, you know, it was developed by, you know, seers and sages and rishis and, you know, those kind of like put the nail here, mm. you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. it's, it's all, it's a whole lot more thought through than, uh, than I think most contracting is probably these days, as you would know, yeah. right, right well, you now. Know, interestingly, I had uh, Brian Hoyer from Shielded Healing, who's been on the show a couple of times. He's at the house now. You'll probably meet him when we get over there. They're over there shielding the bedroom and uh-huh. a couple of the other rooms. And when one of his reps, Nick, came out to do the testing on the house, uh, they test for geopathic stress. They were trained uh, originally, I think, by GeoVital out of, I think they're out of Switzerland, actually. Uh, and so they take these dowsing rods and they mm-hmm. walk across the room and they're they're not moving the rods. The rods move themselves when you cross these ley lines, right? And so he did a grid of the whole bedroom and then they have the different colored um, bars that sort of extend out kind of like a tape measure. And then he showed me the whole grid where the whole grid is in the bedroom. I mean, you could take tape and and show this geometric pattern of energy that's under your foundation, which are these points at which radiation comes through the cracks in the earth or there might be water veins underneath. And um, you don't want to put your bed right on top of one of those, right? I mean, they're linked to cancer and there are um, areas in which um, trees won't grow and things like that because they happen to be planted right on one of those. And it, what was that was trippy. But what was really trippy is um, they take these these 
these bound uh, sort of twisted figure eights of copper that are about mm-hmm. uh, a foot long. And they put one of those in a specific place in the room and then walk back across with the dowsing rods and they don't move. It's like just with a piece of copper, you can nullify the magnetic field coming through the foundation of your house. And then you just keep that thing in your house. And then the whole thing is now um, mute, essentially. You know, yeah. it's it's just, I find this stuff to be so fascinating. And I think why people that are very um, skeptical, critical, analytic type minds, and thank God for those people because they keep the rest of us from being bullshitted yeah. out of our pocketbook. I think because the human mind is generally so susceptible to falsehood uh, that many people that are less than integrous use these energy technologies and quantum stickers <laughs> for your phone and all this stuff to make right. money. Yeah. Many of whom uh, probably know full well that it's total, uh, you know, bullshit. Complete BS, yeah. And so then, you know, that kind of ruins it for the rest of the people that are actually doing it with integrity and can pr- provide some of the testing that you uh, described. In fact, to that point, uh, I post, well, I didn't post, but my social team posted uh, a snippet of my interview that I did here with Philip from... Mm-hmm. Uh, Leela Quantum Tech. And I didn't even watch the clip, so I don't know what was said, but I think I was talking about this little ampule yeah. with the titanium spheres. And yeah. He was explaining what it is and how it does. And someone commented, and he might be watching. If you're watching, this is for you. Um, he said, I'm going to call BS on this. You know, how do we know? Da, da, da. And I commented back. I said, well, you need to watch the whole interview because in the interview, Philip described the blood testing that are doing the HRV testing, et cetera, all the ways in which they've quantify the efficacy of these technologies. So have you seen the actual blood work? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Profound. It's incredible. Yeah. And the first time I experienced that dark field mycos- what's it microscopy. What's microscopy. Micros- dark field microscopy. Microscopy. Yeah. Strange word. Uh was at a <laughs> it's conference very mouth happy. A, a conference years ago uh for these magnetico sleep pads with Dr. Dean Bronley, who's a mm-hmm. uh, you know, an incredible uh, mind in the realm of magnetics. And he created these pads that are really expensive that you put under your mattress and they create this, they sort of mimic the magnetic field that would have been present thousands of years yeah, ago. right. The beneficial magnetic field. Uh, and they mimic that because it's now missing because of the polar shift and solar wind or whatever right. is causing yeah. it. There, there's be. a lot of degradation that's been, <laughs> been going right. on. Schumann resonance is changing. And, yeah. So yeah. he sorted that out and made these pads. And- <laughs> And he I had, love how easy that sounds. Yeah. He sorted that whole geomagnetic <laughs> yeah, thing out. Yeah. But what was really interesting is I said, all right, what's this thing? It's $10,000 for a pad you put on your mattress. Come on. Like, how does this work? And he goes, okay. So we go over, I go over to the nurse and they take some of my blood. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I go lay on this little uh, kind of massage table to have one of these pads on it for about 10 minutes. They go and take the blood. They put them on a computer monitor and the f- before was all coagulated mm-hmm. and they were all clumped together and behaving in strange ways, like an unhealthy, uh, you know, blood sample. And then I lay on this freaking seemingly inert magnetic field for a few minutes. And the after blood was just perfect. Everything's just spaced out perfectly. It's just the healthiest blood you've ever seen. And at that moment I was like, okay, I'm never not believing anything again. Of course I'm going to do my research, but I think these ways of uh, quantifying some of this technology is. is, Trust, but verify. It's yeah. Trust, (laughs) but verify. Uh, trust God, type your camel. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's, you know, that kind of stuff where you're moving from like the the unseen to the seen. Anybody who doesn't think magnetic stuff is, you know, really impactful just because it's just EMF waves, right? But it's in a specific band. Uh, look at transcranial magnetic stimulation. I mean, you can you can elicit huge, very profound responses in somebody's brain just by the application of a magnetic field. You can do the same thing on your arm and and train your muscles and they completely start twitching and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And it's just, it's manipulation of fields that are unseen. It's just that we're such tangible critters, you know, that it's, I think it's difficult sometimes to go, ah, there's more. But by the same token, if you said, well, you generally don't see the air, but you know, it's necessary. I mean, you generally don't see the energy, but it's even more necessary than the air. Like intrinsically, there is a field that is promoting life. And in the fact that, you know, we're like fish in the ocean going, what, what water, yeah. you know, <laughs> a lot of times the best proof yeah. that it's there, it's such a fundamental substrate beneath everything we do. That's a that, great example. Yeah. I mean, the, the life force that just supports us and holds us. I mean, and I know that as a scientist, that sounds kind of frou-frou to say that, but the reality is you have to, you have to sort of accept the reality for what it is. And when you do the testing and it all leads you into one direction, you go, oh, okay, well, I guess we just don't understand that yet. 
you know, and I, that's, I mean, I've been open and candid about seeing things that don't really jive with the way I was trained and the, the things I studied and what I was taught and what I learned. And sometimes when you see that, you can, you have that option of just going, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Or you go, well, obviously it happened. I'm either completely losing my mind or it happened. I just don't have the terminology, the technology, the understanding. So for me, I'm, you know, just, I mean, we're friends. I'm super curious, right? So I'm like, I don't know. I'll go figure it out. Like I will take a year, like in the case of this stuff, that was from something that I saw Dr. Morgan do and, and it kind of tripped me up and I didn't understand how it was possible. So I spent a year effectively figuring out how to do that mechanically to manipulate things in the same way as somebody because, you know, um, you know, saying, oh, I charge this. I put, you know, life force energy into it. And okay, well, that's kind of an ambiguous term. What does that really mean? And, you know, so I just kept peeling back the layers until I figured out how to actually mechanically do the same thing. And it, interestingly, when I did it, I called and said, okay, so here's what I've got. Here's how I did it. Is that right? And he said, yeah, that's it. I said, okay, good. You know, and he said, you know, if you had asked, I would have told you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for, thanks for telling me now. I, I think it's, you know, the perhaps the greatest gift we have as embodied souls are these physical bodies with our senses, right? And uh, for anyone that's done substantial doses of psychedelics or plant medicines, you quickly realize that the world that we perceive <laughs> through our senses is but a fraction of what's actually there, right? Yeah, and, and it's so different from... So it's, a, you know, it's like this gift that we have. Oh my God, I'm in a body, I have senses. A matter appears to be solid and I get to interface with the material world as another seemingly solid being. Yeah. But we really are in terms of the interdimensional nature of reality. We really are kind of locked into a, a, a prison of sorts in terms of our understanding and capacities when we limit what we are able to believe based on what we can perceive through our senses. And so there's a sect of people that I think are so committed to the physical material world because that's what they're used to sensing through their body that they negate the rest of it, which is, in my experience, the bandwidth that we're experiencing sitting here now is, is the tiniest sliver of all reality within the cosmos. And, and it takes finding ways to sort of move past that to where your consciousness can then explore the other realms. Yeah, quite literally, it's, I think, in terms of the EMF structure that we can perceive, it's something like 0.0001% of the total EMF spectra that we as physical beings are able to pick up, you know, just through sight, hearing, right. touch, taste. The spectrum of visible yeah, light it's, is, it's a sliver. Yeah, 300 to 700 spectrum. nanometers, if you're lucky, it's usually more like 400. But if you think about a tetrachromat, right, normally you have uh, just three of the cones in your eyes to pick up color, but, and guys sometimes only have two, but there are some people called tetrachromats that have four and their perception of color is so much broader than ours is you know it's like almost like another order of magnitude kind of thing where they pick up subtleties and colors that we don't even perceive and I, you know i was i've only been around that i know of one person who was like that and it was bizarre because their perception of color was so much more subtle and nuanced like i couldn't discern between two shades of blue and they were like oh what are you kidding this is you know, so very different. And to me, it was the same because that was the perceptual blockade that I had. I was locked in having three cones. So my color perception was this, you know, and, and that's it. But for her, she had that fourth cone and was able to just completely discern with amazing degrees of specificity. Oh, well, this is a little bit more like this and this is like this. And, and it's all blue to me. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, here's to the unseen realms. Um, I fear that we could divert the topic of this conversation forever. <laughs> Um, but I do want to ask one thing and then I really want to get into the ozone because it's something I'm so passionate about and have been into for so long. And you've done something miraculous in creating a product that doesn't require putting things up your butt or in your vein. And, uh, <laughs> this, this stuff right here called biocharged, uh, if you can yep. center in on my camera, uh, very, very, very cool, uh, innovation. It is good stuff. Actually. I really, yeah, I, I took one earlier. It's, it's amazing. Um, but with the concrete, yeah. To digress a little bit, uh, 
are you what press are you in the process of patents or is, yeah, we're is this going to come to market anytime it is soon? Very very shortly. Yeah, oh, we're, cool. we're we're working on about to do a test lab in West Texas and then some other stuff. And yeah, so it'll be it'll be coming to market really quickly. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. It, it, that, so th- I'm lucky because that's something I believe in. Some of the other stuff that I'm getting to play with is gamma shielding. Um, that's very cool because in order to do space travel. I mean, our bodies will get just obliterated if we're exposed to gamma rays once we're outside of the magnetosphere. So I came up with a, a way to do gamma shielding that's kind of elegant that hadn't wow. been done before. And that, that Are you in cool. touch with Elon Musk yet about it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Like, but, I, hope, I hope he hears this because, and if he does, I want to uh, tell him uh, EMFs are dangerous. I heard him on Rogan the other day. I'm like, this guy's either not as smart as he appears to be to many people, or he is the devil because he literally said he's like electromagnetic radiation is it doesn't is impossible for you to hurt you anyway he said you could strap 10 live cell phones to your head and it would do absolutely nothing you could just walk around like that and i'm like really like yeah, the, the data is kind of in on that one because <laughs> like, have you have you there's 30,000 studies <laughs> 30,000 studies linking emf exposure to all sorts of different pathology. And that's not, that's excluding all of the studies done like in the nineties in the beginning of the telecommunication rollout of cell phones that were about the heat transference, right? Like having a hot yeah, cell sure. phone on your head. It has nothing to do with the heat. 30,000 legitimate studies. I decided I was, was going like, to just put an egg in my mouth so I could hard boil <laughs> yeah, it. Over time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was one of the first ones I saw that was, that was actually looking at the heat, right? You put two cell phones that are calling each other uh, uh, on the either side of an egg and it cooks the fucking egg, you know? You know, I've got EMF meters at the lab, but if you put an EMF meter around a cell phone or like in my case, my iPhone, this is why I, I still have, I don't use the, you know, the earbuds. I actually have the old school plug-in cord. Right. It's because it's just a little magnetic membrane and it's, you know, it's a little bitty membrane that's fluctuating, which is a whole lot better for you because there's not much juice there. If you're putting something that's got a Wi-Fi signal, it's like hearing aids that, you know, that, cross between the two and are pulsing frequencies through people's brains. That's not so good. Oh, and, man. you know, you have to look at sometimes when people are like, oh, well, it can't be that bad. Actually, go to the FDA. They just, you know, they approved a thing called a tumor treating field therapy, which is where you use an electromagnetic field and you it's for people with uh, cranial cancer, you know, like glioblastoma and things like that, astrocytomas. They they put, put them around their head and it's they carry a battery pack. And the field inhibits mitotic spindle formation. So it doesn't allow the cancer cells to separate, to replicate. And that was approved by the FDA. And it, they just actually, I think they just approved it for thoracic cancers too. But you have to say, okay, if it has such a pronounced impact that it can stop cancers from forming under this, this condition, then obviously there's got to be the converse to that, right? You know, like you have to be able to say, okay, the field obviously has an effect what can it do both beneficially and detrimentally? And you, you just have to go in eyes open. I, it's hard for me to think that somebody in this day and age wouldn't realize that. Of course, by the same token, if you were building devices where people are sitting <laughs> sitting inside, you know, effectively like on the inside of the Faraday cage being exposed to something, that's, you know, maybe something you don't want to do. Because I think you're going to have a hard time finding somebody at Verizon who's like, oh, cell phones, that'll fry your brain. You totally. Know? Well, it's funny. I asked Philip about that. Uh, yeah, because he was interview. at T-Mobile, right? Yeah, he was like the, <laughs> yeah, I think he was the CFO. I mean, he's a really high yeah, level like executive. V- international VP. I yeah, think. international yeah. VP of T-Mobile. And I asked him during the interview, I said, I mean, you know, when the... When you guys are like in the back room, are you guys talking about the dangers? He's like, nope, never heard about it ever. No one talks about it. No one knows about it. If they do, they... And I said, well, is it, a, is it you know, a nefarious sort of element to the industry? He goes, to be honest, not really. They just don't really know and don't really care. They're just... Uh, they yeah. want to they want to provide a service for people and get paid for it. Ostrich Straight science, up. man. Keep your head in the ground. It's that yeah. Upton Sinclair thing, though, of, you know, you'll have a hard man or, or you'll have a hard time trying to convince someone of something that they're paid to not understand. You know, <laughs> you know, well said, well, you said. know, yeah. Upton Sinclair, sharp. All right, let's get into the ozone. Uh, so, oh man, I have so many questions. Oh, you're pulling this. out paper. Woo. Oh yeah. I always have notes. Um, the first one, my first question was, do I need are, a number two pencil? <laughs> yeah, the first one was, what are some of your latest discoveries? Mm-hmm. And now we're an hour and a half in and we haven't gotten to the second question. Um, so let, let's stay focused here. I'm speaking to myself. Uh, how did you get into ozone? In the first place. So one of my friends uh, has a bunch of real estate and he had some daycares that had been shut down because of COVID. And so we were trying to come up with ways that he could 
decontaminate and purge those spaces. So initially we started looking at UV light. Um, but the problem with UV light, even some of the cooler stuff where you're changing the, the spectrum, you're going down closer to the 200 nanometer range where it, it's such a tight nanometer spectra their spectral band that it, it doesn't actually damage your skin because it, it just won't penetrate. Some of the higher things can actually cause damage to your retina, um, but the, the very tight narrow bands really don't. And so that was kind of a good option. We explored that. But the problem is because it's light, you know, shadows get cast, right? And so if you want something that moves around that and actually can kind of fill the space and, and purge everything and, and do it, well, then you it's not a very far jump to go from... UV to ozone because you actually when you're when you're making ozone there's a little bit of UV emission and so we started looking at ozone and spraying ozone and we were talking about it and I think I think it was my friend Bobby and I think Bobby said well what about you know replacing autohemotherapy like just giving giving it to people so that they would be impervious and I actually didn't think it would be possible to do that because you know I mean I've done autohemotherapy and it's a it's a great thing to do. And you can, I mean, you can definitively, you've done it. You see like a big shift in the color of your blood and after you expose it to the ozone and then you pump it back in. But I thought, okay, you know, I don't really know that it's possible, but let's see. So I started playing with it and I started researching it. And then I found uh, Tesla's work back from the early 1900s when he did the Tesla ozonated oil company. And he had this process um, where he had these big magnetic field beds and then he would put olive oil in it and then bubble ozone through it for eight weeks. And so then I started looking at ozonated oils and there are companies that have been doing that since, but they all have this process where they, they pump ozone through for about two and a half weeks and, and that's it. And so I thought, well, Tesla was a sharp cat, right? So what was he doing, right? He obviously wasn't trying to burn money and time. So there had to be something to that. And then it, it, it dawned on me. I was like, oh my God, it's a polar molecule. So he's basically like getting these suckers to line up in a single file, you know, order so that it's got the highest per unit volume of reactive ozonides that you can get. And I thought, damn, that's, you know, this guy was so ahead of the curve. But then I thought, well, you know, I've got a hundred years more tech than he had access to. So what would he do if he had all of the ridiculous toys that I have? So I came up with like this whole crazy thing to keep adding, adding more intensity to it. And eventually that's, that's what we came up with was, you know, at the end of the day, it was this very little tiny uh, capsule that has a very pronounced effect. And it's, I jokingly think of it like a blitzkrieg, right? Because what's happening is it triggers a hormetic stress response. So there's no actual ozone remaining in it. it. It becomes these things called stabilized ozonides. And so the ozonides are basically signaling molecules. So when you ingest it, it signals to your body that there's uh, an oxidative insult. And so your body reacts accordingly and, and mobilizes all of its own glutathione, superoxide dismutase, and it gets ready to, you know, kind of put itself on uh, on guard and upregulates mitochondrial function and you start pumping out more ATP. And in, in fact, when you take those, you'll feel the heat. Like, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, you actually feel kind of yourself warm when the capsule cracks open. And it's because your mitochondria are upregulating. And so that was kind of the, the, the process to get through the whole thing. And at the end of the day, um, I'd still say there's there's a definitive use case scenario where this is far better because it's easier to do than going to a doctor's office and doing autohemotherapy all the time. And yeah. I just pop them, you know, one in the morning on an empty stomach and roll with it. And everybody always asks, you know, do you do this every day? And I don't. And and I purposely don't do it every day. It's just like C60, right? I don't do that every day either because your body is brilliantly adaptive, and you don't want to do something so that it stops production of its own endogenous antioxidants because you know this is a pro-oxidative thing like carbon 60 is an antioxidative thing but they have the same net effect because because it's pro-oxidative and it sends that signal out your body responds and basically what i did that i thought was actually kind of a, a really keen stroke on this was i figured out a way to up the impact of the signal. So, the, you know, my joke earlier about it goes to 11. <laughs> it was kind of like that. It was like, yeah. I don't want to add more of the actual compound in, but I want it to be louder so that your body thinks it has to mobilize more of a, a response. Funny story. When you you were sending me this stuff that we just call internally brain sauce, and I know that that's, <laughs> that's another one of your pet projects because I was having some cognitive issues probably yeah. as a result of drug abuse earlier in life and cell cell tower exposure for three years that I've talked about ad nauseum on this show because it pissed me off so much. Um, but you had sent me some of the brain sauce that's in a bottle 
And I love that stuff, by the way. It's been incredible for my brain. Ooh. Yeah, I can't wait till that's like a real product yeah. I can share with people. But um, you also sent me, I forget it was like a little bottle or a vial of these little capsules. No, it was a bottle. And there was yeah, no, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And it there was, was a little bitty glass bottle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I had just printed out a little thing with a lightning bolt on the side. Yes, okay. <laughs> so... And I just threw it in my drawer because people mail me some, I mean, very grateful. People mail me so much stuff. I mean, this body can't take it all. You right. know what I mean? Um, and my friends aren't daring enough often to take <laughs> unlabeled things out of my drawer because it might be liquid LSD or something. You know? So wisely, uh, they wisely avoid it. Um, and I don't mean a recreational LSD for the record for microdosing. Anyway, so I had that little bottle and I think it was around the time I was starting to pack my stuff to move and I had run out of the brain sauce. And I found that little bottle and they were, it was kind of sticky inside and it was hard to get them out. So it's had some kind of oil in it. Yeah. Right? And so I was like hitting it on my hand and then I, I popped some of them out and I thought, oh, he must have, this is cool. He must have encapsulated some of the brain sauce. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. How and, many of them did you take? Oh, probably like eight of them. Because I'm thinking, I usually chug Holy cow. with the brain sauce. Uh, I chug probably a good tablespoon yeah, or two. I, yeah, same. Right? Yeah. Uh, pretty liberal and it agrees with me and uh, works well. <laughs> so I thought, well, these capsules are tiny. Like, how many of these do I have to take to get a dose of the brain sauce? So I took them at night. <laughs> And, um, oh, man. yeah. And <laughs> yeah, I did not sleep a wink. I mm -hmm. was like on meth. I mean, I was so wired and had, I mean, I don't remember my stomach being bad, but it definitely was gurgly. Oh yeah. And I was like, what the hell? That's the same stuff I take all the time. What is this? And then oh, I don't know if you God. remember, but I think I texted you and I was like, what are those things? And you said, oh no, that's a different thing. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I always tell people take just one, yeah. and if you're if you're ill, maybe take two because yeah. that's when it, when I get ill, I'll take two. Um, but that's it. Yeah, I. And then, <laughs> oh my god, you took eight. Yeah, so I mean a hand, a big that's, handful, honestly, probably wow. half the bottle that you sent. Yeah, uh, quite a few, six to eight, something that's, like that. That's anyway, pretty hardcore. I lived to tell the tale, uh, and probably cleaned up my gut quite. I'm sure quite it nicely. did. Yeah, but. Uh, but anyway, then shortly after that, you sent me a text of this weird little picture where it was like, you had a little, is in your lab. And I got to, I'm dying to come to your lab uh, at some point, by the way, because uh, it just fascinates me. But it was like, you had made a little box and it looked like it had like tinfoil inside and then you were shooting a laser. Oh, it's actually, okay. It's actually very big. Oh, it is? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looked like this little box and you were like, this is the ozone product I'm working on, which is the, the biocharged. Yeah, uh, yeah that was that was the, the process of figuring out how to do it, right? So I built this basically like, it, it was lined. It was lined with aluminum foil at the time because it was a like I was doing like a plasma confinement field, right? So I had a Rife generator with plasma tubes and then I had lasers to, you know, firing through beam splitters to basically turn the gel into a hologram, right? Because if you think <laughs> if you think about a hologram, right? So you, good. You've seen holographic plates, right? The glass plates where it has the image trapped yes, in it. Yes. Okay. Well, glass is an amorphous solid. It's not a crystalline solid. So it's not, it's not really like you'd think of a stable solid over say a thousand years or 10,000 years, like in old churches in Europe, you know how the bottom of the glass is wider than the top of the glass. It's because it's actually more like a liquid, like a like a soap film or a sheet of water that's falling, but it's out of our normal temporal scale, right? To a human, it seems like it's solid, but if you expand your time scale out greatly, then it's it's going to look like it's coming down like a sheet of liquid, right? Or like glass blowing, right? I mean, right? Yeah, it's it in a flow. A, yeah. yeah, it's a flow, and so it's the same thing over time. It just gravity has an effect on it, and it just moves. So I had this thought when I was working on this of like, okay, I've figured out how to get this thing harmonizing, harmonizing and entrain the states and pump more energy into it through additive harmonics, how do I keep it there? So it doesn't just go and kind of piddle out. And then I thought, well, you know, holographic plates are basically in a liquid, just in a slightly different time scale. And so the difference between using a gel and using a piece of glass in terms of how quickly they'll move is much closer than using a very fast pulse laser. Like there's a bigger disparity in time. So I thought, okay, well, I should be able to holographically lock this thing in as long as I'm using, you know, something that's coherent. And so that that's what that field was. So it's got lasers firing through beam splitters to, to trap it at a certain specific frequency state and lock it into that media. And then at the same time, the plasma is pulsing and then I have an auditory component that's going to create mechanical resonance in the thing. So 
Yeah. So to back up a little bit for people that are like, I've heard of ozone because I remember back when it was in the 80s, like our ozone layer was being depleted, yeah. et cetera. So I think that's where I first heard the word. But as I understand it, based on my ozone generator at home, I've got a, a little medical grade oxygen mm -hmm. tank and then there's a valve on that. And I turn the valve on and there's a tube that takes that oxygen through some electrolysis yeah, exactly. system. It's like electrocuting essentially. Yeah, it's two, two plates and it's ionizing between the plates. Okay, and yeah. then it comes out the other end, which goes either in my ears through a stethoscope or up the with a, with a <laughs> right. catheter. And uh, people love that one. Um, Rectal inflation. Yeah, I got to tell you a it's funny- It's a pastime. <laughs> I got to tell you a funny story about a, a little press piece I had right as I was leaving LA. But anyway. Oh um, no, I saw yeah, that, man. I actually- <laughs> saw that yeah dude oh man dave asprey emailed me a couple days ago actually he was like congrats on the press that was great luke you know wait <laughs> way to go biohacking i was like did you see the part where all they did was talk about my butthole like the the, oh uh, the, the, the air quotes journalist like he sat and talked to me for probably about three hours in my backyard and we talked about spirituality and how how much I value meditation and it's the inner journey. And then I have a bunch of toys just to support my biology so I can do my spiritual work here, yeah. which is really my, the premise of my work and my life. And we had a really great, you know, I took them up to the biocharger, not this, by the way, this is biocharged is this ozonated oil we're talking about and the biocharger, which is a different device entirely. Um, but anyway, I put them on the biocharger. We did all kinds of things. He goes, ah, oh, this is great. Is there anything else? I was like, well, I got an ozone generator inside, but like everyone has one of those, big deal, you know? So he comes in and he's like, well, how's this work? I say, well, you know, a few days a week or if I'm starting to feel under the weather at all, I, I, I do a rectal insulfation, 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 insulfation. Yeah. And, uh, and he was, you know, just kind of in passing, oh, okay, whatever. And then that, becomes... and then in the article, it's like the focal point, it's me, Max Lugavere and, and Aaron Alexander. And really like, I was kind of the star of the piece, you know, thankfully I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, but the main star of the piece was how I like to put things up my butt and how ridiculous it is. Yeah. And then he also indicated uh, that, and, you know, I'm grateful <laughs> to be included. But And then he also says, like, and there's no scientific evidence to support the fact that uh, ozone has any effect on viruses. I'm like, what? really? Wow. I'm like, how about about 100 years of scientific research for you? Here you go. But anyway... Uh, I digress. Uh, that was just a funny thing to share. And I'm, yeah, I'm that, glad you read it. Sometimes with, with the stuff that we do, I, I was talking to a, another friend that does a lot of biohacking stuff. And it's, I mean, we all do things that are bizarre, right? Like you, you have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I'm now building a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. I, I burned some squares and I was trying to do a, I built a TC, TDCS unit, the transcranial direct current stimulator. And I was trying to see if I could potentiate more flow uh, synaptically. And I just thought, oh, the voltage gating, I, I can crank it up. So I cranked it up to the high setting. And after a couple minutes, I was like, God, it's starting to feel discomfort. And so I took the pads <laughs> off and I had burned squares <laughs> into my forehead. I was like, yeah, that's the, you know, the downside of better biohacking. Living, better living through science. <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is about some of these things that to your average person seem extremes. Okay. So say to this writer from Los Angeles magazine, right. Um, you know, great guy. I wrote him an email and busted his balls heavily. And, you know, he was kind <laughs> enough to reply because uh, there was another comment in there. And it's not like my ego's hurt. I'm just like, dude, you're doing a disservice to empowering people to take care of their own body and have a sense of sovereignty and well-being. Uh, the other thing that got me there was um, he interviewed me about uh, the the inoculations that start with a V. I don't even like saying the V word on my podcast because right. I don't want to be shadow Reek. banned. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he was talking about this uh, this virus that's going around now, apparently. Uh, and There's a virus going around? What? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> this and, is news. And he was talking about the, the vaccines that you can get for it. And, you know, he said, well, are you going to get it? And I said, no, Peter, to be honest, uh, you know, I would, you'd have to kill me before I would take one of those things personally. But you do you. Anyone out there, my body, my choice, right? Yeah. Like, go for it. I fully support anyone that wants to do whatever they want to do with their body. It's their body. Uh, but I would never do it. So, and I explained some of the reasons why. Did he no, lambast you as an anti-vaxxer guy? Basically, well, yeah. you know, just a few things. I point out zero liability. We are the clinical human trials for it. Like we're, some of us are volunteering for that. All the things, right? And in the article, it's like, it gives my quotes there, which I said a lot more than that, but he made me like <laughs> anti-vaxxer guy. And then, and then it, <laughs> but, like then, a nightmare but then interview. the end of the paragraph was this, and it's like, you know, story says, I would rather die than take one of those vaccines. 
And sadly, that might just be what happens. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's a shame they don't have the audio where it goes, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, insinuating <laughs> that I might die of a, a RNA gene therapy deficiency. I'm like, I don't think so. Like, if anyone's going to die of this thing, it's probably not me, you know, thankfully. Uh, but anyway, hilarious stuff. <laughs> but to the average person, um, Having an ozone generator in your laundry room, as I did at that time, and a couple of days a week, yeah. you know, uh, doing, I know, it seems weird, but man. doing the rectal ozone. But the framework I'm coming from here is like walk into a hospital as a fly on the wall and watch people's brains being cut open, watch triple bypass surgery, watch someone going through chemotherapy, watch someone with diabetes having their foot amputated. I mean, on and on and on, right? Like, that to me, and I don't know what world I'm living in, that seems extreme. <laughs> like That's extreme. To me, taking care of myself and using supplements and technologies and stuff is, is not extreme at all comparatively to the end result of living the modern lifestyle and all that all the pathology that so ensues if you're not, you know, living in a way that supports your health. It's, so it's barbaric, man. I, I mean, honestly, the, you know, I think people again, a thousand years from now, we'll look back and they'll have the same take that, you know, we have when we look back a thousand years ago, oh my God, they cut off his leg because it was wet. You know, he had a small infection. He got a scratch and now they didn't have any right. So they chopped his leg off. Think about frontal lobotomies. <laughs> this is not that long ago. Someone, you know, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, whatever. And they would just carve out a part of your brain and turn you into a vegetable. That wasn't like a thousand years ago. No, that was less than a hundred years. That ago. was in my lifetime. That was still happening, right? And yeah. so to me, the extremities of self-care uh, into the biohacking realm are, is not really extreme at all. So you burned your head a little bit. It's like, well, better burn your head than end up with Alzheimer's. And well, right. You know, yeah, it's like, actually, no, that's, that's totally true. And I mean, you know, I mean, you're taking the brain cell stuff and that, you know, that's got all kinds of pronounced effects and they're metered out and tested. And, you know, I mean, you, you, proof is in the pudding. You know, it works because you've done it. Um, at some point, you know, the data will come out on that stuff and I'll do something with it. But yeah, you, we're, we're tr always trying to push the bounds. I, it's actually the thing that's unfortunate to me about an article like that is I wish more people were in the biohacking space because if nothing else, it just has them take control of their own body, which is theirs from the get-go anyway. You know, they may as well do something beneficial with it. Yeah. If, if, if not that, then it's going to be left up to the influence of, you know, Madison Avenue and have more Doritos. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, right? that's, <laughs> I'd I, rather do the rectal insufflation personally, but you and know, it's, you know, that's because to, I understand ozone. And to be honest, it's no party, which is why I'm so happy that you produced a product where you take a tiny little pill every day instead of going through that. But, but backing up a little bit to the mechanics of this, just so people understand. So, uh, ozone created by, uh, essentially running electricity through, oxygen and mm -hmm. then you get what's called ozone which is a gas right yeah so basically it's oxygen the type that we breathe is o2 and it's stable o3 is ozone and it has this extra oxygen atom and because of that it has a charge so because it's it's got the extra charge it's going to you know interact and most everything in nature this is why nature uses ozone as a disinfectant because nature is not really set up um anything and manifest reality is not set up to be able to withstand something stripping away electrons and pulling them apart. And that's what fundamentally happens. You've got this unstable thing and it wants to bind. And in the process of coming off to rebalance itself, it pulls, you know, electrons off. And so you, you stabilize things that way, but it, it's um, like forced oxidation, right? You're rusting something and viruses are susceptible because it rips them apart. Bacteria, same thing. I mean, that's, it is, it's nature's disinfectant. After a lightning storm with high arcing electricity, when that cracks through the air, it strips, it ionizes and strips off, you know, one of those atoms and then they recombine to form O3 and, but they're very unstable. It's, it's about the, the third most reactive molecular species. And so the interactions are really quick. That's why when you do um, autohemotherapy, you know, you, you pull your blood, but when you pump the ozone into it, the ozone goes in. And when you see that color change, what you're actually seeing there is the formation of ozonides which are, you know, stabilized signaling molecules. That's because this, there is no actual ozone in it at this point. Those ozonides, it's, you know, nine oxynononoic acid, one nonono. Well, it does all these, it's called a triple redox reaction. It's a reduction oxidation reaction. It basically, it stabilizes those things in a certain format, but they still have a reactivity, which is why your body picks it up as an insult. But it, it's, it's nature, man. I mean, most of the things that, you know, that I'll, 
do are just taking something that's already done far better, you know, by, by nature <laughs> in some form or fashion. That's my formula too. I mean, think about red light therapy, hyperbaric. Yeah. I mean, most of the things that I gravitate toward are just either mimicking or amplifying something that exists in our natural environment. And largely uh, those things include um, things that we would have had in our experience right. prior, right? Sun exposure. We're not yeah. getting sun we exposure. We just don't have it anymore. We live under these freaking blue lights. Well, so. magnetics, right? Yeah, 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 all of that. So you take a PEMF device like the amp coil or the biocharger mm-hmm. or something like that, and you're just taking something that exists in nature or the magnetico sleep pads, and you're just harnessing those powers through the brilliance of the human mind and of amplifying them into your system. But with all of this stuff, I always think we wouldn't need any of this support if we were 100,000 years ago, or say even 15,000 years ago. No. Right? Like pre-agriculture, roving tribes of uh, hunter-gatherer people that are living off the land. We're out in the sun. We're doing our thing. We have resilience from the hot and cold exposure, dipping into hot springs here and there, jumping in a cold river. Like we'd be doing... You know, breathing heavily because we're running up a yeah. mountain chasing a deer. There's our breath work. <laughs> it's like, I think all these biohacking things are just props to prop us up in our domesticated human zoo it is, environment. Man. It's completely, because, it's artifice for the yeah. sake of trying to get back to what we are naturally. Yeah, and it's a lot of goddamn work and money. And I, you know, if I could go back in time, I probably would. Well, yeah, man. But, uh, you know, time machines, that's yeah, a, that's yeah, a thing. <laughs> I would go back and tell them, don't do agriculture. Just keep hunting. You guys are fucking up so bad right now. Uh, And the 60 hertz in our homes, that would be another one. I would be like, no, you know. Actually, sometimes you see things like that. And I I wonder, why would anybody pick that specific frequency? Uh, You know? I mean, I've heard lots of different theories on it. But I mean, you can... You can look at the detrimental biological impact of that. And right now there's a lot of work going on with things at 40 hertz because they're finding that 40 hertz ameliorates the effects of, you know, some dementia and the beginning progression of Alzheimer's. And there, there's a lot, you know, MIT was doing a bunch of work with it. And why not go with that, right? From your visual perceptual field, there's there's no difference between something cycling 40 times a second and something te- cycling 60 times a second. However, biologically, the impact is very pronounced. You it's know? the same with the ways in which we tune instruments now to 440 yeah, hertz. Yeah, 440 Or 440, yeah. yeah. So it's like, uh, why? who did that? Why did we do that when it's now proven scientifically yeah. that... Yeah. That that music is has a more agitating effect on your brain waves than music tuned to four thirty two, which is what classical music and all yeah. ancient music was tuned to. It's really see when I would play jazz, I always knew that I wasn't actually flat. I was just being progressive <laughs> and forward thinking. Yeah, right? I'm not flat. I'm just forward thinking. Yeah, I saw an amazing study the other day of uh, the effect of four forty hertz versus four thirty two hertz in music and the effect that it has on your brain waves, and it was astonishing. It was like. Then it begs the question, well, who did that? And yeah, why, why would you do that? Yeah, why was it done? Music was working just fine. All the violins and pianos everywhere in the world were tuned to 432. It was all a big party. And then someone came in like, ah. Okay, pop quiz. Do you know any uh, popular songs that are done at 432? Imagine John yeah. Lennon. Or I guess, yeah, yeah John Lennon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say the Beatles, but no, John And Lennon, when you listen yeah. to that song, you feel it. It's, yeah. It is definitively a visceral feel. And yeah. it's because of that tuning. Yeah, it has, that piano has this, sort of pull it kind of pulls your your awareness in it does evoke a different feeling Mm -hmm. um okay so back to the ozone okay so you in your lab so you're taking ozone gas and you're um you're uh infusing this uh what is it safflower oil sunflower oil sunflower oil Do you make the oil and then put it in your laser machine? Yeah, so it's completely ozonated before it goes into okay. the process. So the, the ozonated oil, I mean, lots of groups sell that. And it's fine. I mean, it's good stuff. It just doesn't have the the same oomph. And, and you can definitively tell the difference. I mean, you don't have to even do the blood work. You can literally just take one pill, feel it, and then wait a day, take the other pill, feel it, and you notice the difference. You know what I found about other ingestible ozonated oil too is they tend to make you burp up ozone which is not an entirely pleasant experience it is kind of an unpleasant because yeah. i did i did a lot of research on it before and i tested a bunch of stuff that was made elsewhere and yeah i, I mean you know like anything else because it, it initially we didn't even think that it was going to be necessarily a product kind of a thing that we were going to do but it made sense after the fact to do it that way but it was just you know like oh well what can we do to keep people from you know having 
this negative impact of being sick? Uh, okay, so with ozone in general, uh, one of the things, I'll just think of the things that I use it for or, or you know, have some knowledge of its um, uh, use for is uh, if I ever have a bug bite or a cut or a scrape mm-hmm. or a bruise or something like that, there's a company called Global Healing. I finally found a topical ozone oil mm-hmm. that is not super sticky and not super stinky, and that's the one that I finally settled on. It, it's really kind of more viscous. It almost feels like um, like a hand sanitizer, kind mm-hmm. of, but it's it's strong and you keep it in the refrigerator. Anything that you like, any risk of infection topically, just immediately gone. Like oh, yeah. the next day, you're just it wasn't even there. It's incredible. Uh, but many of them on the market are quite sticky and super, super smelly. And Allison, uh, yeah. the, the lady at home, uh, whom I love so dearly, uh, she hates the smell of the ozone oil. I actually, I'm not really a fan because there's <laughs> there's an entire quadrant of my lab when you walk by where you just, <laughs> you, yeah. know, you get popped in the nose by ozone. That's actually, when I had COVID, that was how I knew I had COVID is I was taking a resistor cap in the morning. My daughter had been diagnosed with it. And it was Christmas or New Year's Eve, rather. And I went in and I took my capsule and I knew that she had been positive the day before, tested positive. So she had obviously been, you know, kind of symptomatic for a little while and probably spreading it. And and I got it. But I went in and I took my resistor capsule and I smelled nothing. And I thought, hmm, obviously these guys have either <laughs> nailed the encapsulation process right. to a degree that no one actually does or... I'm not smelling it. So I put my nose in the bottle, didn't smell anything. Then I actually took one of the capsules and opened it up and put it on the inside of my nostrils and could smell no ozone. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's not good. So, wow. yeah. Um, okay. So, so topically. Topically, uh, it's fantastic. I, We're I, actually about to do a topical. Oh, cool. And it, I'll, I'll send you some because it does not, it actually, it has a smell, but it does not smell like ozone. Oh, cool. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is. So another thing would be, the positive effect it has on things like candida, mm-hmm. you know, fungal overgrowth, um, uh, bacteria, viruses. Even in that Los Angeles Times article, he was like, there's no proof that it does anything on viruses. I did a web search of ozone plus Ebola and just all of this research oh, yeah. no, uh, there's came a, up. There's a litany, you know, like Ebola, it cracks the tail off so the virus can't replicate. With most viruses, I mean, literally nature's not designed to be able to block something assaulting it at the subatomic level, right? If you're going to strip electrons and that's your mechanism of action, you're going to be able to destroy most things that you're trying to destroy. Um, when people are taking this, it's actually, it's at a specially coated capsule, so it's delayed release. And the idea there was, I wanted it to go all the way down past your stomach and get in, you know, to the small intestine so it would open there and be more like a systemic effect, just like autohemotherapy. But... If somebody has candida or something like that, I will tell them, take it with food in the morning. Take one capsule with food because it'll go into the stomach and it'll sit in the stomach and then it'll start to go past that. And as it opens in the stomach and starts to move past the area where you're going to have all the candida living, it will have a very pronounced effect on the candida. Literally just a couple of days, it'll wipe it out. Oh, that's good to know yeah. because I just did some testing with Dr. Scott Schur and... Uh a stool test and found a little candida. And I was like, what? But I didn't. Knock it out, man. Yeah. yeah. It's it's actually, yeah. And just do the retest on it. Yeah. With food. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because he sent me some kind of herbal stuff. And of course, I was thinking like, I have an ozone generator. Like that kills everything, (laughs) you know? I actually, I, the the guys at Transcription, Scott and Ted. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. 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 um, They they are great. They have become good friends after the introduction from you. So thank you Oh, cool. I didn't remember that took place. Yeah, they're great. Uh, Dr. Ted's going to come out and do another podcast here pretty soon, I think in May. Uh, Yeah. So the thing that I always wonder about ozone is since it's such a powerful oxidizer and it just nullifies virus, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, is there any risk to it damaging the bacteria that you actually want oh, in yeah. your GI? Hundred percent, yeah. And so, that's, so if I were to take a pro, like my just drives <laughs> spore based probiotic and then take one of these ozonated oil pills, is it just going to knock out those spores? No. See that that's the interesting thing. That's why I was saying it's kind of like the Blitzkrieg effect. So you can get a, a direct interaction if you block it and have it kind of open up right where the candida is going to be or in that vicinity. That's one effect. But in general, it's such a small amount that it's not really going to do that. 
And that was by design so that it, it would allow your body to upregulate its own systems and have more energy and mobilize so it wouldn't just eviscerate your gut microbiota. Because, you know, you don't, I mean, most of the Which stuff that's Which is probably what I did there, the night when I took the whole bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, well, and that's very, very purposely why I say take one. Yeah. Is, you know, um, and I'm a big guy, so I'll take two, but I don't, yeah, more than that, you, yeah, you're, you're opening up a lot and you don't want to do that. So yeah, there's, like anything else, the, the fact that it has a pronounced effect, you have to use it judiciously. I mean, it's not something, and you know this from personal experience, if you overdo it and you don't do it the way it's intended to be done, you'll end up with a problem. Uh, one of the things that I've heard about ozone that I totally don't understand, and it sounds like you might be able to answer, is <laughs> the increase of systemic oxygen absorption, mm -hmm. A, and B, how it works to get rid of senescent or dead cells and helps the robust uh, mitochondria to stay intact while getting rid of the old tired ass mitochondria. Could you break down those pieces? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So senescent cells for, for everybody who doesn't know are just zombie cells, right? And they get the term because normally um, a cell doesn't just die and go away when it's dysregulated, right? There's a protein dysregulation. And so it's performing some sort of aberrant function. It's not operating at peak capacity. So it's got a little bit of damage. It's mitochondrially dysregulated. It's not pumping out as much energy. So when you take ozone, the first part of that is the, the upregulation in oxygen is because those those oxygen atoms that are the, you know, that make it the ozonides, when those things bop off, they restabilize. A lot of times they'll interact, but when they don't, they, they will rebond just like with ozone in the atmosphere. It'll rebond to form O2 and O2 instead of O3 and attaching to say like a, a fatty acid or something like that. So when the O2s kick off, you do end up with extra oxygen in the system. So you have more oxygenation. The way that upregulates mitochondria is, you know, more oxygen around there it's oxidative phosphorylation is the process where you, you take in, you know, food and water and oxygen. And it's kind of, it goes through the process of the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, or, you know, the last part of that being oxidative phosphorylation, you break it down and you, and you shift the electrons and the protons through this whole cycle to end up with more energy. In the, in the case of more oxygen, when you have more oxygen, it's like going into a hyperbaric chamber, you're upregulating your subcellular function inside the mitochondria. You have more fuel to burn and you do that. You, but interestingly, you can also do it with photonics, right? If you use red light, same thing. You're forcibly accelerating the cell cycle because in, in that case, it's a little different. There's a, you know, a thing called cytochrome and you, you actually use the, the specific red light frequency or infrared light frequency to oscillate it and it kicks off nitrous oxide, which is then replaced with an oxygen molecule. And that forcibly cycles the cell through oxidative phosphorylation. So that's why um, with some things like when you're regrowing dermal tissue or hair or something like that, you want to stimulate with red light because you're, you're trying to end up with a more pronounced growth rate than is normally biologically available to you. So you up the fuel, right? It's just like, it's just like your car goes faster if it's an old school gasoline car. Uh, and you and you have an internal combustion engine, it goes faster because you add more fuel. It's literally the same thing. You're just adding more fuel to the system. So in terms of the senescent cells and getting rid of those, your body goes through a process of autophagy. And, and when it gets triggered, when there's an upregulation of production and you have a surplus of energy, your body reaches this point where it's trying to find homeostasis. So it's leveling out at a, a higher level. And if you have dysregulated cells that are senescent, when you have more energy in the system, it goes through and it calls out the cells that are weak and not outputting the, the proper amount. The, in, in fact, it's not just that it happens on the, the cellular level. It also happens subcellularly. You, you have the same thing, but it's called mitophagy, where your body inside an individual cell, like say a cardiac cell, you've got about 5,000 mitochondria per cell. It assesses the output level of all of those different mitochondria and then goes, these guys aren't working. And it stimulates these things called lysosomes and they come in and they gobble it up and break it down into cellular components and then reintroduce it and reuse those. So you, you're constantly going through this dynamic process where your body's trying to optimize performance. And so when you have more energy, it's just like healing a wound or anything else. That's, you know, that is kind of the, the, really in a nutshell, what's going on is you're, you're looking at the dysregulated parts and you're replacing them with the components that work and function. So that's, that's how it happens. That's amazing. Yeah. So 
Yeah, because I always just think of ozone and I relegate it to, it's just nature's disinfectant, as you said. Yeah. Just <laughs> brings me back to when Donald Trump got so much shit for talking about disinfectants. Uh, yeah, I don't know if he's referring to ozone, but then everyone in the media said he was talking about injecting bleach. I thought that was hilarious <laughs> fake news. I'm like, really? Like nature has a disinfectant. Watch a, a, a lightning storm. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you injecting, smell it. injecting ozone. I mean, people do direct <clears throat> injections of ozone. I've yeah. Actually, that's one modality I haven't done. You know, I did that once in uh, in very shady conditions and it was, it was kind of scary. It <laughs> Was, <laughs> How does one, no, hey, want some ozone? Yeah, How does that no, <laughs> it was it was legit. And anyone in LA has probably been with this guy who uh, who administers it. But it was like going to a shooting gallery, you know, <laughs> ozone like, Johnny. What? Like, yeah, and it, come they on just, over. They ozone took a Johnny. needle like right out of the generator and filled up a syringe, yeah. and then just popped it like right into your vein. And their theory was, and I actually wasn't even going to talk about this, but. Their theory was that unlike when you do the 10 pass ozone where you're taking your blood out and then ozonating the blood and putting it back in, which I guess you, you're making these ozonides, right? Is that right. what you Yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. So they're just putting ozone directly into the blood instead of taking it out and putting it back in. And their theory was that it was a much more potent therapy. It is a uh, much more potent way. therapy. But man, it was scary. There's, there's also some problems with that because when you introduce it to any sort of membrane like your endothelial linings, right? Like all of your endothelium you're not just hitting the blood with the ozone when you do that. You're hitting your endothelium and you you do not want to rip holes in that. I mean, that's your vasculature, man. You don't want to, that's a, that's a little bit dicey in terms of the approach. That's why you, you have to be really careful when you're doing like rectal or vaginal insufflation. You have to make sure that the person's getting exactly the right dose. The flow rate isn't too high. The concentration isn't too high because those membranes will just get eviscerated. And oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it literally it goes in and... I mean, if you think about the process of oxidation and stripping that away, you're actually taking that membrane and excoriating the surface of the membrane. And that's that's a no bueno. Good to know yeah. because when I use my ozone generator, I don't pay all that much attention to the flow rate. Yeah, you need to make sure it's metered out the right way or you'll actually damage the lining of the mucosa. Noted. Yeah. Thank you for that. You might have just saved my life. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time sitting there with a catheter up. The, there, there are certain you know places, yeah, the, the <clears throat> burns on the forehead, a little easier to deal with yeah. the internal no, that's, burning. That's why. Because yeah. I did actually send my, uh, my ozone generator is just a homemade one. Uh, I mean, I don't, it's, it's legit, but it was homemade mm -hmm. and it doesn't have, it doesn't tell you what the settings are. Um, the longevity, I think it's called longevity, something out of Canada. They're the uh -huh. ones that I rep on my site because they were the most recommended by Frank Schallenberger, who's kind of the granddaddy yeah. of ozone medicine yeah. out of Reno. And uh, Schallenberger recommends that one. And my dad got one. So I sent my generator to them to make sure there were no... Uh, you know, metals or any kind of plastics that were going to leach and get oxidized and end up in the gas. And it passed all those tests, but they did something cool and they tested the flow rate and mm -hmm. the different um, uh, concentration of ozone coming out of it with the different settings. And right. I actually have that little printout they sent me. Um, I think it was like 500 bucks to get them to look at it and ship it back to me. But then I was like, that's nice. I'll just keep doing whatever. <laughs> so it's, th it's thank good you for that. because the guys that work with it a lot, like Frank Schallenberger, Robert Rowan, those guys really have it dialed in. You know, and yeah. and that is the the core of a lot of I mean their practice right is using is it ozone For in sure. Cuba. I always tell people go check out the Cuban research because there is so much research in Cuba that that's truly brilliant. Like they've de dealt with all sorts of conditions, really advanced stuff, um, and it was out of necessity, right? They had access to an ozone generator. They were kind of shut off because of you know global climate for uh, Cuba. Um, and all the sanctions. And so they they just said, okay, well, we have this to play with. And they they really did brilliantly figure out a lot of stuff. Go, you know, check out that research. It's amazing. Cool. Actually, there's a lot of it on it. If you go to the biocharge.co site, mm -hmm. there's a ton of a ton of that stuff. It's well oh, worth cool. looking at. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Then uh let's see where where I want to go here. I don't want to leave anything out because uh do, you know. Do, do, yeah. do. Ah, I know what I wanted to ask you. So it's interesting, the mitochondrial function and energy production, ATP mm -hmm. production and the uh, autophagy, getting rid of those dead cells. I mean, that in and of itself is really powerful. Yeah. Just if you just were, gonna, yeah, if you if you were do... just going to do ozone for that, it would be just worth doing. Um, but on that note, in terms of uh, the microbiome, mm -hmm. have you seen any evidence to support its use for preventing or healing leaky gut issues? There are actually, there are some studies on that. I personally haven't done any research on it um, and we haven't done any testing on it. So 
I don't want to speak out of turn, but yeah, there, there are some studies on that. Um, there was a fellow named Velio Bocci, uh, who was an Italian physician and he has uh, a, a huge tome. It's a big fat, thick book, um, on ozone and the medical uses of ozone. And you can look in, in Bocci's book and there, there's some references to that, I believe. Cool. Okay. Interesting. And uh, then let me see what else I was going to talk about. Oh, back on the topical, mm-hmm. uh, something that people really struggle with, two things that are you know, seemingly impossible at times to sort out, and that is uh, acne and eczema. It actually does have a really good effect I've seen on eczema because uh, I know some people that have used it on that, and it seems to have a pretty good effect. Uh, we haven't done any studies on it. I, I don't know that I've actually seen any studies on eczema. There was some, some dermatitis the things that I had seen studies on, but not specifically the eczema, um, but w- worth looking at. Um, and then acne, it, it because it will go into, I believe, the sebum and knock out some of the little, you know, nasty bacteria that's in there. It does have an effect on that. And I've actually used it on uh, someone that had acne and, and she said that there was a pretty pronounced effect. So. Have, you, have you ever heard of anyone using DMSO as a driver to get topical ozone deeper into the tissue? I don't know that I would do that. Yeah, because there's going to be a reaction between the DMSO and the ozone and you're not going to end up with the same. You're going to end up with a slightly adulterated product um, just because the molecular interaction there is not going to be one that delivers the ozone past the dermis like that. You're gonna, you're gonna crack that molecule. I was just curious because I find DMSO to be one of those things that's just, it's kind of like, um, you know, grandma's medicine cabinet type thing. It's horse liniment, man. I it's, mean, it's, it's truly, it's old school horse liniment. It's so, it's so simple and easy to use. And anytime I wanna drive anything like a pain cream or mm-hmm. CBD oil or something like that into my skin, I always have these rollers of DMSO and it's just incredible. Oh, it works like a champ. I mean, I, you know, I used it with the, the hair serum stuff because I needed something that was a transdermal agent to, to push that into the cells. And, and I actually, I pulled my hamstring way back when it was a C60 related accident. And that's what I put on. It was DMSO. And man, that stuff works like a champ. Just by itself without even using it as a Yeah. I mean, it truly, it was old school horse liniment. That was dimethyl sulfoxide was horse liniment. I mean, we use it in the lab all the time because it's a great solvent. I was actually, I was breaking down some stuff yesterday and, you know, the option was to use DMSO to do the, uh, it was, okra toxin and you know and it's soluble in dmso and ethanol um of of the two when i was playing with a toxin i i opted to go with the ethanol in lieu of the dmso because i didn't really think the idea of playing with a hardcore toxin and a penetrant was really really like hey i've got this thing that might just punch all of this into my tissue great idea yeah yeah, yeah. so so i opted for the ethanol in lieu of the dmso but yeah dmso is fantastic stuff it's it's actually it's only approved if memory serves um for interstitial cystitis um, via the FDA. But my understanding is that the reason it didn't really get widespread approval is there was no way to do a double blind placebo controlled trial because when you take it, and I know that garlic, man, the moment it hits your skin, it reeks. Yeah. And you taste garlic in your mouth instantly because it's in your bloodstream in under two seconds. Yeah. And it, will make you, if you use enough of it, it'll make you smell the next day even after it's washed off. Yes, you do. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. You smell very much like garlic. You smell like a walking (laughs) bottle of pesto or something. Yeah. I know what I wanted to ask you then. uh, In terms of uh, this biocharged, not biocharger that that you guys have created. um, Biocharged. Why did you choose that particular oil, the sunflower oil, over olive oil uh, that seems to be the most ubiquitous in the industry of ozonated oils? Uh, the concentration of ozonides is higher in sunflower oil. And people, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, it's a, you know, it's a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's not. At, at the end of the process, it's not because you've done this triple pass redox reaction. So it's stabilized as four different molecular byproducts. So it's no longer a polyunsaturated fatty acid, but oh, cool. it, it holds more ozonides per unit. Actually, hemp uh, is, if you're looking just for pound for pound, what will actually hold the most, hemp would actually hold more, but it, the smell is a little different. And, you know, in the ozone smell is one thing, but the ozone mixed with hemp is, I didn't find it to be terribly palatable. Man, I mean, I think, oh, there is one thing I wanted to talk about uh, with the ozone, taking it internally. Mm -hmm. How does it assist with detoxification? I wouldn't actually, 
it's only a peripheral assist. It's not going to be a direct assist. I wouldn't actually do it in terms of detox. Um, in fact, if people have something systemically that's going on, I always tell them to take binders with it because you can actually trigger if you take too many of them. You're lucky that you're in really good shape and live a really clean lifestyle because taking eight capsules or however many capsules that was, you'll trigger you know a, a Herxheimer reaction because you you will your body will mobilize and you'll break down a lot of stuff. And when you end up with too many you know bad byproducts in your system and no way to process those out, it toxins out your liver and your kidneys. And you'll have a Herxheimer reaction. So I always tell people, really take it with a binder if you're going to take it for, you know, any specific condition. Like, you know, if you've got candida or something like that, suck down some binders, then take the capsule with food. Cool. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't actually, I wouldn't recommend it specifically for a detox. In fact, just the opposite. I mean, it's the thing that goes in and cleans it, but it's not detoxing it. Use a good binder for that, you know, um, activated charcoal, uh, some lipolyzed C60, some, anything like that that's going to that's gonna actually have a bind to the toxins as they release, but the ozone really won't. I remember texting you on a few occasions and asking you to sort of formulate the sequence of some of the different routines that I do because... <laughs> yeah, I, and the I don't, very intense routines. I don't know that, that we do. ever got to the bottom of it, but uh, some of the practices that I engage in are creating oxidation. Yeah. Some of them are antioxidant. Some of them cause inflammation. Some of them nullify the inflammation. So I'm often wondering, uh, and any of the diehard biohackers listening will find value in this question. Others yeah. will be like, you're nuts. Uh, but when it comes to the sequence, you know, you mentioned red light having this effect and mm -hmm. um, getting in front of that, that plasma and, and um, Tesla coil magnetic field of the biocharger and the hyperbaric chamber mm -hmm. and the ice baths and saunas, like those things where you're causing uh, your body to react in certain ways, have you settled on um, like a sequence? I guess, I don't know if you need to include all of those because it might be a whole other show and I don't know if you've kind of done the research, but since, oxidant, uh, since ozone is such a powerful oxidizing agent, yeah. how do you time it with anything, whether it's a supplement, food, or practice that is antioxidant? Do you want to bring in... Do you want to bring in the oxidizing moment first uh, with the ozone and then later on stack on antioxidant, anti-inflammatory things or vice versa? Or no, I usually do oxidizing and then I squelch it. So give me some examples of some of the <clears throat> other things that are oxidizing in addition to introducing ozone into your body. A uh, lot of vitamin C. Yeah. So my preference is to always try and do the the oxidative approach first. And so I'll do, you know, like high dose vitamin C or something like that, because small concentration of vitamin C, it's an antioxidant, but it flip flops its effect in your body. It's kind of like, um, you know, how if you do lemon, right, you think of lemon as acidic, but because of the, the, the balance of so many minerals in it, it actually has the effect of being alkaline in your system. So I really try and do all of my pro oxidative stuff first and then I'll hammer it back with, you know, large concentrations of usually my, my antioxidant of choice is still C60. I'm, uh, I'm very much sold on that camp, but I, but I like, there are some other modalities. Like I very much like, um, not that this is pro oxidative or antioxidative because it's balanced, but hyperbaric oxygen, I think that's great because you're, like I had said earlier, you're adding more fuel into the system. Um, you know, I have a bank of red lights in the lab and, you know, I, I love red light therapy. I think it's brilliant. Um, no pun intended because it, it just, I mean, it, it does things <laughs> that if you were out in the sun early in the morning, you, you'd have a big uptick and you'd feel great. Um, but those are the, those are the kind of things. So I try and do that, you know, the stuff that's going to <clears throat> boost the cycle and then kind of subdue the cycle at the end of the day. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to get the, the real pro oxidative insult at the end of your day to, at least from my way of thinking, because I'd like to kind of relax at the end of the day and allow my body to repair, not be under assault. You know, it's, it's kind of that it's really following more of a natural cycle where at the end of the day, you're doing the things that are restorative and regenerative and restful. Hence we sleep at night as opposed to, you know, go out and like, ah, I'm going to drink five cups of coffee at midnight. Right. That yeah. makes sense. So, so in the morning then, uh, we would do, our ozone, like take a biocharged yeah. capsule, uh, workout, mm -hmm. 
right? Something yeah, that's exactly be- very oxidative where you're going to be breaking tissue down. You know, you might do um, you might do the sauna then at the same time. Do all the stuff that's really energy consumptive for your body and then do the things that are kind of restorative later. So, yeah, break it down where you do, you know, your biocharge. You take a capsule of that. Then you're going to go in and work out hard. Then you're going to do a vibe plate and a sauna. And then <clears throat> then you start rolling it around if it were me, middle of the day doing things like the the biocharger where you're doing things that are kind of setting up the baseline so that you actually have the energy to move forward. And then I'd start taking the supplements and doing the things like, you know, you were talking about Newcom earlier and I haven't done it personally, but having seen the effects of it, I would do things like take C60, do the Newcom, um, do some sort of meditative practice or kind of a light yoga. Like if you're going to do like vinyasa flow or something hardcore, do it early in the day. You know, if you're going to go out and do big room or something like that, do it in the morning, same cycle, kind of embrace the day, amp up your energy, give yourself the fuel to just charge in. And then at the end of the day, start cycling down. I mean, it's all a natural cycle, right? Yeah. I mean, sense. we're, we're still creatures that have evolved on the planet. And where would, uh, <laughs> where would an ice bath fit into or cryotherapy fit into that Cryo- sequence? Oh, that's cryotherapy's aces. That's, that's like the big week start of the squelch movement i would uh i would put it since it's the most pronounced i would do i'd probably work up towards like doing a sauna and then that's kind of the the midday phase where it starts to roll over as you've done your sauna you've done you know the capsule biocharged worked out vibe plate sauna cold plunge and which is a shock to the system but it's contrast hydrotherapy it's brilliant i mean it works like a champ and I would go immediately from one to the other. I would do the sauna and then whack yourself with a cold plunge right afterwards. The best. And then, and then I would roll into the rest of the day doing all of the antioxidant, relaxing sorts of restorative things. Awesome. Yeah, that, because that. you end up with the biggest cycle, right? Like you're trying, yeah. to, <clears throat> you're trying to maximize your energy because I know, you know, because we're friends, I get like what you're trying to do, right? You want to impact people's consciousness and move the needle for people and change how their perception of the world is all the cool stuff that you know we see and have access to you're trying to get it out to people so to do that you personally need more oomph right you're not kidding bro <laughs> no man I, I, that's the thing is you know Especially you push right hard. now yeah oh, well man. it's you know I, uh. I i try and do the same thing i'm just excited about i still can't believe that i get to do what i get to do it's like i feel yeah. like a kid in a candy store well, it's funny you say that because as you're as you're running through the litany of of these practices and uh, modalities and whatnot, I'm thinking I know there are probably a few thousand listeners that are like you dicks. I have a job. Like when when, <laughs> when, like, when am I going to do the fifty things? You know, and I, I get it. And you know, it's a light four hour workout, right? <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I mean, and it, you know, I always say this, but it's it's so important for people to know. You know, I I truly don't believe you need any pills, devices any of the stuff even that costs money to be happy and healthy, if you're willing to put in some breath work, yeah, uh, you know, some yeah, that's spir- true, man. spiritual practices, getting some cold water. Uh, Go outside, walk around yeah, with your shoes the off. Yeah, sun, grounding, you know, I mean, really, I think the most potent things, A, don't take tons of time, and B, are largely free. Grounding is an antioxidative therapy. Right. right. I mean, you know, and it's like <laughs> it's literally baseline. You, you don't have to do a whole lot to walk outside and take your shoes and socks off. You know, most people can yeah. find ground. Yeah. Go to Central Park. Yeah. You know. And then for those of us that are, you know, so inclined, then we stack 50 things in a day. And uh, and I work really hard, as you said, and I'm super busy. And I just, I, I don't know, I sacrifice other things like watching TV or... <laughs> Yeah. Other things, uh, even scrolling on your phone. I mean, how many of us have like, you know, gone into an Instagram K hole and like next thing you know, you <laughs> you pull your head out and you're like, where did those forty five minutes go? Like I got nothing done. It's just the hypnotic nature of these, you know, the technology and things like that. So I think at the by the same token, many of us actually have much more time uh expendable in our day than we're aware of if you're not really tracking how you spend your time. So yeah, well, three yeah. minutes in an ice bath every day will change your freaking life. And you can do what I did. 100% it will. Get a Sears freezer for... That's exactly what I did. $700 and, and plug that puppy in, fill it up with water, unplug it when you get in, and there you have an ice bath. 
Uh, I'm excited though. Uh, this Friday, I'm interviewing these folks from Morosco Forge who make a fancy. Oh, I have seen those. That's yeah, like, and that's so like the Cadillac of ice. Baths. I'm getting one of those to celebrate the new the new house. It's nice. A, it's a bit of a uh, you know a splurge, but um, what they did that's really cool is they have an ozone generator in their uh, filtration system that cleans the water. Because that's the thing with the Sears model. Uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, but the water gets pretty swampy after a couple mm-hmm. of weeks, depending on how many people are getting in it and how sweaty and gross they are. But um, man, I use the uh, Morozco over at the ARX headquarters mm-hmm. here where I work out on Sunday mornings. And sweaty person after sweaty person gets out of the, I mean, they go in the uh, in the sauna space, sauna, sweat, then go in that workout, get in that. That water is pristine and clean. I don't think they ever, I don't think you actually need to even change it really. It's just that ozone just nukes no, any it, bacteria. It does. I mean, that's that's the thing. That's why nature uses it. Nature is nothing if not efficient. Somewhat yeah. brutal occasionally, but very efficient. Yeah, efficient at, uh, at apocalyptic <laughs> <laughs> events every couple million years that kills all of us. Hopefully there's not one anytime It's like soon. shaking the Etch-a-Sketch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for, for people who would actually know what an Etch-a-Sketch well, it's is. Fu- it's funny, you know, I mean, I'm all for environmentalism and not littering and polluting and, you know, I'm out against Monsanto and chemtrails and all the things that I think are the real, uh, you know, the, the bad players here. But at the same time, I can't help but kind of zooming out from the earth. And it's like George Carlin had a great skit on this once. I don't know if you've seen it where he's like, really? Like, do you think you're that important people that like, you're going to kill the planet? Trust me. <laughs> if the planet wants you off, it's like one sneeze and this bacterial film called humanity is toast, gone, never was here. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, we're just, a, you know, at times, unfortunately, a very destructive and uh, corrosive film on the surface of the earth. But by and large, we're, we're so, um, you know, such a, a minute part of the ecosystem when we're behaving ourselves, you know? I, you know, that's actually, that's one of the things that worries me is I, I'm not worried about the planet surviving. I know that, you know, it's going to be ducky. It doesn't right. care if it's, you know, humans, thunder lizards, six-eyed telepathic slugs. What you right, know, there, right. there, will be, there will be some organism, whether it's, you know, cockroaches and Keith Richards, something will be here <laughs> and, and will persist, you know, long yeah. after the rest of everything is gone. But I just worry about the, you know, humanity, what we're doing. Yeah. It, like my big concerns lately are, you know, phytoplankton and bees. You know, yeah, because if for you, real, my dad always used to call it the cosmic trigger. You know, you, you've pulled the cosmic trigger. You just don't realize that it's already been pulled. And so you have this very downstream effect where you've done something that's just, you know, intrinsically harmful and you can't undo it. And that's, that's why I worry about, you know, what's going on with fishing and phytoplankton, because you know, that stuff pumps out what, like five times more oxygen than all the Amazon yeah. rainforest. That's, you know, our oxygen levels are dropping. No wonder people aren't as bright as they used to be. You know, we're, we're designed for 21% oxygen capacity. And right now we have 19, you know, and it's dropping. So, I mean, yeah, you literally, real. you don't have enough fuel. You're not going to get the thing to go as quickly. And the bees, the bees, that's always my, uh, my uh, thing with EMF, mm-hmm. you know. Is- that's actually, I worked on a lot of tech to, to block that. And we, we did some. Really? Yeah. It's funny, I, you know, because I do a lot of C60 work. And I, I went to uh, hang out with one of the guys who discovered that and got the Nobel Prize. And he's this really cool guy named Bob Curl. And he's a professor at Rice in Houston. And I went to see him. And he's genuinely, like, you know, you're around some people and you can just tell they're kind. And he's super kind. And of all the stuff that we talked about, what I was working on with bees, I think, was the thing that he found the most compelling. And I, and I think that's because he's such a bright guy that he could see that the impact of that was that was the thing that would move the needle the most in, in, of all the stuff I was doing. And some of it was, you know, like, oh, cancer research and things that sound really showy, but they're not really the things that are going to have the most profound impacts. You know, I mean, for a long time, I had been working on you know, the, the gamma thing to get the gamma shielding working. And then I was working on propulsion systems and I've got a couple of those because I think the idea of using, you know, rockets to get to outer space is ludicrous. I know that that's the common thought now, but I'm sure it's going to be replaced here pretty shortly. I'm actually working on getting some things to run CubeSats so we can do small testing of ionic drive systems for CubeSats so that you can, you know, change the telemetry on those things because it's, it's tiny, right? 10 centimeters cubically. So, um, that's the kind of stuff that I think is going to make a big impact, right? You get people, you get them off the rock so that they can do some travel. And I think also that would unify things a lot. You know, people, if people believe that 
if they can see the totality of the planet and realize like, oh, look, we're all, you know, we're earthlings and we're from this place and see the the commonality with one another, I think that would do so much to just whack the divisiveness and the separateness that everybody has right now. And yeah. so to me, yeah. that was one of the things, you know, that was on my board, superluminal travel, because I don't really think space travel is going to be all that doable until you have an engine that can approximate, you know, the speed of light. Yeah, so, or until we can, you know, fold dimensions. <laughs> well, right. yeah, that's, I think that's one of the things, that, you know, you were asking earlier, one of the things that I've been working on that kind of excites me is um, Ted Achacoso. We were talking and I, I, I. Oh man, I want to be a fly on the wall in a room when you two geniuses, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not blowing smoke your ass. You two are the smartest humans I've ever known. And, well, he's and maybe awesome. I've known a bunch of dumb people and you guys just stand <laughs> out, but, uh, but no, both of we you. Go, are, we go to town, terrible. man. Like I literally will just. Oh, for, for, you know, for an hour and a He's half. He's a brilliant guy, right? He is. Yeah. He is. It's and a really so much kind fun. hearted. I know. You know his, just... his whole approach to, uh, to pharmacology is, is just genius. What he's, yeah. what he's trying to do and how he's trying to promote it. I mean, the, I, they were talking about developing, you know, non-addictive opioid therapeutics. And I'm, I, I so love the way he approaches it. And, and he is, he's a brilliant guy and it's so much fun to talk to him about stuff like that. And I was talking about this thing that I had developed in the lab because you know, sometimes I'm spurred on by my kids who, you know, don't you know, like, I'll tell them something, they'll go, right, whatever. You know, that's not possible. And I had been talking about this thing called an EM drive. And, and the theory behind it was a little dicey and kind of misconstrued. And they were like, oh, you can't do that. And I was like, yeah, I can. And so I went in and I sent one of my guys out and bought a bunch of microwaves and some other stuff and, and uh, just broke it apart over a weekend and, and built one. And because I understood the, the theory behind it and I was talking to Ted about it and Ted lit up like a Christmas tree because he got it. And immediately he started asking all the right questions. And I was so impressed. I was like, oh my God, this is great. Like this cat really gets it. Like, and he, yeah. he did, he asked all the right questions. I was like, well, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? I was like, oh, okay. And so I just explained the process to him and, it, and it's neat because it, like, it doesn't sound like much because it doesn't output a ton of force. But the thing is, there's no propellant, right? So you can do it. When I when I initially did it, I got I was using a very precise balance to to gauge the effects, and it was 0. 0.0007 grams of force, which is minuscule. And then I tweaked everything, and got 0. 0.0070, so it was like a tenfold increase. And then I went back and tweaked some more stuff, and then I got 0. 0.1417, which was where I stopped tinkering with it because I only did it every weekend just to prove the fact that I could actually do it. But it was it was notable and in terms of it doesn't sound like much but if you look at kind of what nasa has been tinkering with and um you know they're kind of coming up with a one of their postulated ideas was this thing called a helical drive system where they have like a, basically like a particle accelerator and use that but it would have to be huge it would have to be like this 200 meter long 36 foot wide uh, thing that burns 165 megawatts to propel it, which is a lot of juice as opposed wow. to, you know, a, a slightly more elegant system, which is what I came up with. But I, you know, th there's only so much time in the day to tinker with stuff. And a lot of times I'll do stuff like that because I'm like, Ooh, this seems neat. Let's see what we can do, you know? And, but, but again, it's all part of, it sounds funny, but the things that I wrote on my board, that was one of the things that I felt like it was okay for me to work on because it was something that, initially when I wrote the list on the board, I thought, okay, if I can do this, it, it helps, right? It moves the needle because if people can actually travel in space freely without propellant based systems, they'll do a lot more. And everybody knows that. I mean, it's not like some big idea. I actually kind of applaud Elon Musk's approach because he's taking the old school tech and he's just trying to optimize the old school tech because it's what everybody's working with. You know, it's like, effectively, it's kind of funny because it is, it's like taking a gasoline car and making it a better gasoline car, which is sort of antithetical to how he seemingly approaches most things. But, you know, you can't, you can't go in and change every industry right out of the gate simultaneously. Right, right. <laughs> you know. thing I've always tripped on, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up here in a moment, but um, I just never, I don't know if I'm healthy, skeptical, or paranoid, probably a little of both. Uh, when it comes to the powers that be and and the information that is dispersed to us minions down here uh, mm -hmm. in the lower realms of the echelon of power, 
But I've always found it very dubious that we supposedly went to the moon on the times or time when we did. (laughs) And they're calling each other on a telephone from the moon (laughs) down here. And now we can't get back there all these years later. Like, do you think that we actually ever went there? And if so, why the hell have we not been able to get together the technology to go back? You know, I would like to think that we did. Um, But the thing that concerns me, actually, just, I mean, as anybody who's reasonably thinking, yeah, my take is that we did. But obviously, some things have been lost, I think, because maybe it was that we just didn't know. But I know that if you go outside of the magnetosphere and you book it towards the moon, you are just obliterating your genome. I mean, Mm -hmm. you're, you know, uh, Stanford released some data about a year ago talking about what would actually happen to the gut microbiota if you um, if you were exposed to gamma rays long term. And, you know, you could make it to Mars, but if you don't have really good gamma shielding up, the if you colonize it, the first generation will suffer a little bit and they'll all get cancer probably. But the second generation, they're hosed. You know, you'd probably end up with having offspring that would make thalidomide babies look like Olympic athletes. I mean, it could be, <laughs> it could be kind of brutal. Oh, well, man. I mean, you, you well. can only allow for so much genetic dysregulation before you actually start having really detrimentally impactful consequences. And if you don't pay attention to blocking that kind of stuff, you know, it, it actually doesn't make me feel really good that somebody leading the charge on that is, you know, like, oh, EMFs, oh, there's nothing to that. You know, that's that's not really a... I'm not even exaggerating. <laughs> you can listen to the Joe Rogan episode. <laughs> Rodents of unusual size? I, I don't like, think where, they even exist. And even, Ro- you know? <laughs> even Rogan, he was like, ah, you know, these kooks, these conspiracy theories that think radiation is bad for you. And then his premise was the difference between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation, right? And, yeah. And so it was like, oh, the non-ionizing radiation is totally harmless. And I'm like, no, what? <laughs> Flatly, no. Yeah. I, you know. I mean, it's just, I, I think why I'm so triggered by folks that ignore that um, for whatever reason uh, is because subjectively, I was so negatively impacted by acute exposure for yeah, three years. Like I know I'm a healthy guy and I got sick and there was no other intervention at all in my life except two cell towers right outside my bedroom uh, window. You yeah, know? man. Well, it's, you know, we talked about that last year. I mean, it's voltage gated calcium ion channel flow. It does not take much to dysregulate it. You know, with the virus that's going around, it deprotonates the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's one of the things that it does. And you're just talking about little minuscule charges, you know, like things like ivermectin actually reprotonate that membrane. And so it, you know, it, it ups the calcium flow. So it, it shuts that down a little bit. Those are very super, super, super subtle effects, you know, millimolar scale concentrations of things, and they have a huge impact. And you can elicit that same response, whether it's chemically, electromagnetically, and it, it really doesn't take much. I mean, just look at cells under a microscope and put a router by them. Or try and try and sprout some, you know, something. Just get some Brussels sprouts or, you know, alfalfa sprouts or something. And put a router next to it and then put some other sprouts on the other side of the house and watch the difference. You know, I mean, if you're really skeptical about it and genuinely curious, that's a three-day experiment. Do that and just watch how one grows and one does not. Yeah. And it will yeah. very clearly tell you like, oh. You know, it's yeah. not voodoo. It's it's just it's subcellular dysregulation of calcium potentiation. I mean, that's like, it's right there. Yeah. You know, it's just because you can't see it like, oh, I, you know, you don't have the access to see the inside of your cells and what's not happening. And that's that's the same thing. I mean, you can be you can be an ostrich by virtue of not wanting to believe it, or you can be an ostrich by virtue of believing something that's totally fallacious. Same net effect though, right? You keep your head in the sand, you're pickled. Yeah. Well, uh, in closing, I just remembered there was one thing we we didn't really uh, explain out, and that was about the bees and why, you know, one of my beefs with the way that we communicate um, wirelessly is the navigation system of the bees being dependent on a magnetic field. They use magnetics to navigate, yeah. and when those are interfered with by the widespread um, fields going through the air to make our cell phones talk to each other. They don't know where the hell they're going. And so it interferes with their migration and their ability to reproduce. And uh, the net end of that, as you know, but just to share with the audience, what I was leading into was uh, if there's no bees, we got no food. Yeah. 
You know, I mean, it's like, that's it. So yeah, like you said, the planet will be here just going, aha, bye guys. <laughs> you, you, you mosquitoes. That were just, yeah, like yeah. the planet is not going to miss us. The planet will be fine. It'll just regurgitate a bunch of magma and, you know, make yeah. new mountains and oceans and it'll just go on doing its thing, but we'll be gone. So yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's important, uh, important topics to talk about and you're doing important work in the world. I want to thank you for coming back on the show. Oh, I'm happy to be here, man. I, I mean, really like am. I said, with our, our hour long pre-conversation <laughs> and this one, I, you know, I'm hoping people that were, had their interest and passion peaked, hung in with us here. Cause I think there was just so much value. Um, I, I would like to, I applaud what you're doing. I mean, you're getting a great message out and it's, it's impactful. I mean, there, there are a lot of people, you know, um, who are really beneficially impacted by this. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, you know, there are. I'm so grateful for that. I get messages from people every day. I mean, every day. And I appreciate them so much. I read everyone and they're like, oh my God, my life has changed so much because of the things I'm learning from your guests and the things yeah. that you choose to talk about. And uh, yeah, it feels really good. And uh, on that note, I want to let people know, and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but uh, what's the website for this biocharged uh, resistor that we were talking yeah, about? Yeah, biocharged.co. Okay. Yeah. Biocharge.co. Cool. And we'll, I'm sure, have a code or something for that I can share yeah. with people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but up. yeah, very cool stuff, man. Yeah, I'm, man. And I'm happy to see you. You know, you've got your work with C60. That was what our last episode was about. We'll yeah. put a link to that in the show notes. And so I've been kind of waiting as you do these formulations and send me your... <laughs> Your uh, sometimes risky beta products with no le- with no uh, d- instructions <laughs> on strange them. labels. Yeah, yeah, next time put a label on there and be like, Luke, do not eat more than one. Uh, yeah, but it's cool to see that you've now you know kind of harnessed your creativity and uh, intellect into something that's um, I think going to be so meaningful for people because ozone in, in the way that we're used to doing it is not something that's. Uh, accessible to so many people no, because of the expense and the inconvenience. And uh, so, yeah, kudos on really bringing something cool out. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right.